Hello, believers, non-believers, and everyone in between. You're listening to Stories with Sapphire. I am Sapphire Sandalo. Now get cozy and open your mind because it's story time. As of now, all six episodes of my new series, Ghost Town Terror, have aired on Travel Channel and can be streamed anytime on the Discovery Plus app. This episode contains mild spoilers for the season finale. In the final episode of Ghost Town Terror, a very heavy ritual was going on in the saloon at Gunslinger Gulch, the ranch that I and my team had been investigating for weeks. Psychic medium Sarah Lemos and I were on our own exploring outside, trying to see if we could sense any energetic shifts. Everyone on the crew was inside the saloon filming. We were the only ones outside in the cold Montana air. We heard what sounded like someone throwing a rock. Just a faint little hit. But enough to warrant closer investigation. We walked towards where we thought we heard the sound, and then we heard it again. It was almost as if the sound was leading us somewhere. And I'm walking a few feet in front of Sarah, video camera in my right hand, left hand swinging low, and I suddenly brush the bottom of my hand near my wrist against something. I had gloves on so I couldn't make out any textures. I turned to look down and see what it was, but there was absolutely nothing there. I turned to Sarah and asked her, Did you just touch me? even though I knew she was a good couple of feet behind me. She said no. I tried to recreate the feeling. Maybe my coat jacket hit my hand, but I could not duplicate it. I told Sarah what I felt, and her response sent a chill throughout my already freezing body. I don't mean to creep you out, but what would be small and hold onto your hand? Throughout our time filming, Karen, the owner of the property, had mentioned seeing a little boy who she believes followed her from her previous home. She is certain he is the spirit of a boy named Abraham who was repeatedly beaten during his life because he would appear to her with bruises and cuts all over his body. Was it this little boy that I had just interacted with? Shortly after my hand was touched, the ritual in the saloon went south. The timing made me very uneasy, and I never got any closure after we wrapped filming. Long after I had left Montana and come back to LA, I had actually forgotten about that moment. I refused to believe that my hand grazed a little ghost boy. And then I was having drinks with my friend Ian, who has been developing his psychic abilities, and I was telling him about how my time in Montana was, And he asked if something unexplainable happened, and the memory popped right back into my head. I said, yes. He asked, was it something physical? I said, yes. Did it happen to the left side of your body? Yes. Did it happen on your wrist? I stared at him. There was no way he could have known that. If it was a lucky guess... It was incredibly lucky. A week or so later, I was talking to another psychic friend of mine. Yes, I have a lot of psychic friends. And before I told them anything about the shoot, they told me that there were actually several entities that were eyeing me at Gunslinger Gulch. They described one of these entities as a four foot tall little boy with lacerations all over his body. Two people, who were not with me in Montana, nor knew anyone who worked on the show, picked up on details about that moment. It was enough for me to start believing that something paranormal really did happen that night. I didn't know what to do. I was suddenly much more afraid than I was before. If it was possible for that little boy to physically touch me, was it possible that he followed me back home? 
There is no shortage of ghost stories and horror movies with little kids, living or dead. And that's what I wanted to explore in today's episode. Why are little kids so creepy? First, I narrate a story of a young girl who made a friend beyond the grave. Then, I share the story of how a spectral girl helped a person discover their true identity. And finally, I tell the tale of a Romanian creature that takes the form of a young girl. Chapter 1. That Boy's Mommy. Submitted by Lunar Fox. This happened before I was born, so I only remember what my father told me. When my sister Lindsay was about three years old, and even now that she's 18, she had the little characteristic of being quite antisocial and not really wanting to meet new people. It's not as intense nowadays, but when she was little, she would hardly stray from my father's side. And this didn't change when my father took my sister to meet his mother, her grandmother. I was told since she had passed before I was even born, that she was an amazing grandma, the kind that'll bake you cookies and buy you the things that your parents say no to, the ideal storybook grandmother. Well, Lindsay wasn't all that ecstatic to meet her. When my father took her to get acquainted with this strange family member, she clung desperately to my dad's leg, not making any effort to speak with her. Don't worry, my grandmother said. Next time, she'll warm up a bit, I'm sure. My grandmother developed lung cancer from smoking. There was no next time. My sister would always play quietly in her bedroom with a door ajar, just silently having fun with whatever pencil and paper or plushie she had. My father was in the living room watching television when he heard her talking to someone. He was able to see clearly into Lindsay's room from his spot on the recliner in the den, and so he craned his head over to peek into her bedroom. There she was, sitting on the carpet and speaking to someone just out of view. It couldn't have been my mother since she was at work. My father muted the television to try and hear what my sister was saying. He couldn't catch it too well, but she was definitely speaking fondly to someone else, My dad hoisted himself out of his chair and made his way across to her room. There was no one. Just her in that room. All right, that's a bit weird, he thought. Nonetheless, he asked my sister, Who are you talking to? That boy's mommy, she replied cheerfully. Okay, he simply accepted the answer and went back into the den to sit down. Maybe she had just made an imaginary friend. It's a bit out of character for her, but hey, she is a little kid after all. It wasn't long until he heard her talking again. He got up and went over to her room. Again, there was no one. Who are you talking to, Linz? He asked, now a bit concerned. That boy's mommy, she repeated, unfazed by my father's worry. This little pattern repeated a couple more times before he pressed, What boy's mommy? Lindsay stood up and walked right out of her room, leading my father into the den. She came to a stop and looked back at my dad. That boy's mommy. She pointed at the piano. On the piano was an old photo. A photo of my father as a kid, sitting in the arms of his mother. I guess my grandmother was right. She did warm up the next time. I've heard countless stories like this where a young child speaks to someone that an adult cannot see. But what I haven't heard is a shy, antisocial child being more comfortable around someone after they've died. I was also a very shy kid. I wasn't comfortable smiling at or talking to people. It felt incredibly vulnerable. Still does, to be honest. So I get it. And I wonder if Lindsay understood that this woman, who was essentially a stranger, could not be a threat because she wasn't physically there. And then that makes me wonder if any of the few people that I was comfortable around as a kid were not physically there either. Has this ever happened to you or anyone you know?
Chapter 2 Is She With Me or In Me? Submitted by Jocelyn When I was in my teenage years, I used to volunteer for our church quite a bit, so much that I was granted a key for basic rooms on the property. One Thursday night, I went into the fellowship hall to do my homework. It was a large, quiet place where I wouldn't disturb the choir rehearsal, which my mother was attending. I left most of the lights off, save for the stage lighting, so as not to draw any attention. Being bored and easily distracted, I wandered onto the stage. Theater was a passion of mine, and still is to this day. I looked out at the tables and chairs set up for Sunday morning study, imagining a crowd eagerly awaiting me to perform. From the back of the room, I noticed something moving in the darkness— a shadowy figure trying to remain inconspicuous amongst the spread-out furniture. I'd casually look away and then back to see if the figure was gone, hoping that it was nothing more than my overactive imagination. But the being remained, an outline darker than the gloom it emerged from. I saw them move closer, all the while seeming to not wish to garner my attention. I lost track of them about 50 feet away from me, only to turn to my left and see them standing right next to me on the stage. From what I could make out, she was about my age, a girl with blonde hair wearing a white shirt, overall shorts, and sandals. The light shone through her as though she were a Pepper's ghost illusion. She made no motion towards me, but seemed to stare at me in a curious fashion. I once again looked away, hoping that my mind was playing tricks on me, when I looked back, she was still there. Her eyes locked onto me, amazed that I could see her. With that, I slowly walked down the stairs and prayed that I would be safe and that nothing ill would befall me. It was at that moment that I felt her cold fingers holding my hand, a rush of fear echoing through my body. There was no malice in the act. Rather, it felt like she wished to comfort me and ease my trepidation. I made no sudden rush to leave the room, but in my state of worry, I felt that a hasty exodus was in order. When my mother joined up with me after rehearsal, she asked what had happened, sensing that something was wrong. I explained the happening, and she showed her concern, warning me that I should be careful when going off by myself. Our family is all too familiar with the other side, which is something we normally did not discuss with the rest of the congregation. I now understand why. Around that time, I was also exploring who I was as a person. And in college, my wardrobe expanded to more than just male clothing. This was kept hidden from my family for obvious reasons. After my friends had moved, it was something I just sort of packed up and tried to ignore as I didn't feel comfortable being myself around the new people I had met, being taught it was wrong from our church's standpoint. Almost 20 years later, in the ironic year of 2020, I came to the realization of who I am, coming out as gender fluid. My spouse knew for quite some time, stating that I was the last to admit it and noticing numerous traits that I had been completely oblivious to. To this day, I occasionally wonder about that night, if it was a spirit that saw me for who I really was, or possibly the other part of me beckoning me to open up to who I am. Divine guidance can appear to us in many different forms. I'm so confident that that is what Joss experienced. It happens in a church, after all, even if it's a church that doesn't sound very open-minded. I think the little girl appeared to Joss to remind her that even if she didn't feel truly seen and accepted by family, the church, or even herself, that she and all of Joss's guides on the other side could see her, and that Joss was never nor ever will be truly alone. Chapter 3, The Iele, submitted by Gloria. 
My grandfather passed away 15 years ago. This is a story that he told me and my cousins when we were kids. We still discuss it to this day. None of us really know what to think about it, but we all have a silent consensus that it gives us the chills. Whenever he told this story, it was less of a legend and more of a recounting, like he was really remembering something that actually happened to him. My grandpa was a kind, passionate man who always stood up for what he believed in. He believed this encounter wholeheartedly and would always impart caution so that I would never have the same experience. My grandfather was born in 1924 in Romania to a poor family in a rural village that was constantly struggling to keep food on the table. He grew up learning how to live off the land. His parents taught him the importance of never taking more from nature than you needed. If you treat the earth respectfully, it will always have something to give you in return. So even though they struggled, they would always manage to find a way to keep themselves alive. When World War II broke out, my grandpa, then a young man in his early 20s, was assigned to stand guard on the outskirts of their village along with a group of other soldiers. They would patrol the area and keep watch at night, staring out over the mountains from the edge of the forest. As a kid, my grandfather was bullied relentlessly for his kind, caring demeanor, and this didn't change when he became a soldier. He was always mocked by the other men for being soft and doing things like sparing the lives of small animals he came across and taking time to pray for any dead men he found, even if they were the enemy. They were still people, my grandpa would protest when his platoon commanded him to stop. Everyone is equal in the grave. I'm surprised they even sent you here. The other soldiers would snicker. You're far too weak to bring anyone victory. The words and exclusion hurt my grandpa deeply, but he never engaged in any of their taunts and refused to stop being himself, even if it meant he would spend most of his time sad and lonely. One day, when he was assigned to patrol the edge of the field that led off into the mountains, he came across something strange that he had never seen before. A ring of grass not too far from the camp, singed red and black, as if it had been scorched. It didn't make any sense. There had been no fires out here recently. They would have seen the smoke from their lookout. And even if there had been someone camping out here, there were only a few trees to seek cover behind in this field. No man could set up a fire here without being seen. And what kind of fire burned in a circle, anyways? Suddenly, he heard a noise from the trees below him, and he immediately pulled out his gun to defend himself. A few of his fellow patrolmen heard him shouting for the person to show themselves, and they instantly ran down to join him. They all kept their weapons raised when they saw a girl, no older than a teenager, walk fearfully out of the forest. Her long, blonde hair was disheveled. She was caked in dirt and her clothes were torn. But somehow, despite all that, she was still incredibly beautiful. She seemed to almost radiate her gorgeousness, even looking as scared as she was. My grandpa couldn't find one single flaw about her. My grandpa recalls it seeming strange, unnatural. You were trespassing on military property, the lead soldier of their group shouted at her and immediately forced her to kneel on the ground with her hands up. She's just a girl, my grandfather reasoned, probably from the village a few miles over. It's hunting season and the people are hungry. I'm sure she's out here looking for food. The other soldiers couldn't deny the possibility since it was the most practical. There were many small communities throughout the countryside that were experiencing famine during the war, and it was extremely common for parents to send their children out to look for food when they themselves became too weak to do so. That doesn't matter, the lead soldier snapped, roughly striking the girl across the face. She shouldn't be here. My grandpa couldn't stand to see an innocent person be hurt by the men he was working with. She's unarmed, he said firmly. There is no reason to hold her here. Let her go. No, the lead soldier growled, a slight tinge of hysteria to his voice. We need to question her. 
The others, seeing how strange and senseless this command was, didn't protest when my grandpa ignored the order by turning to the girl and telling her to go. She didn't need to be told twice and ran off as quickly as she could back into the trees. My grandpa knew he would be punished for this, not just for ignoring his commanding officer, but again for being the weak one in his group. But saving an innocent civilian was more important to him, so he mustered up his strength and took the mocking and shoving all the way back to camp. He was banned from dinner that night for what he'd done, his commander fuming at him for letting the girl get away. The other soldiers all agreed that it was odd for their superior to be so upset about a peasant girl, someone who clearly had nothing to offer them and wouldn't be able to answer any questions worthwhile. But they were all worried they would be punished as well if they objected to him, so no one said anything. My grandfather patrolled the edge of camp alone that night while the other men had their food. His stomach was painfully empty, and he felt stiff and tired. They had very little food to begin with, so to have nothing was even worse. He wondered if maybe he was weak, like the others said he was. Maybe he would never belong anywhere. But then he remembered the girl he set free that day. She was probably more hungry than he was, and he felt guilty for pitying himself when there were others like her out there who were also suffering. Never mind the fact that something about her seemed wrong. He chided himself for having that premonition about such a young and disadvantaged girl, but he could never quite shake that sense of unnatural strangeness that seemed to come from her, like she wasn't real. He wondered if part of the reason he let her go was that he didn't want to be around her, didn't feel safe being around her. Suddenly, a shrill scream tore through the quiet of the night, and my grandfather immediately turned on his weapon's flashlight and set in that direction. His blood ran cold. He knew that scream, that voice. It was his commanding officer. He ran as quickly as he could to the source of the cries and realized it was the same place they'd been at earlier, the area of the clearing where the grass circle was. It was harder to tell in the dark. He shone his flashlight where the noise was coming from, but he didn't need it for long. There, in the field, was the same circle of grass he'd seen earlier, only this time, it was on fire. Flames burned brightly in a perfect ring, and there, dancing in the midst of the fire, was the girl they'd seen earlier. She was naked and moving methodically amongst the embers, her bare feet stepping effortlessly in the heat. None of her was burning. Her skin remained unmarked by the flames, flawless as it was before. And in the middle of the circle lay the mutilated body of the commander, his corpse torn and shredded. The young woman continued dancing around the circle, moving to the beat of loud drums that were nowhere to be seen, yet almost deafening. When she spun to the rhythm, she happened to turn towards my grandpa, and revealed her smiling face to be covered in blood. Teeth stained red from the flesh of the commander. Droplets of red were stark stains in her blonde hair. My grandpa fell backward in shock, terrified and heart nearly beating out of his chest. He couldn't move, frozen in fear as he stared at the dancing girl. No, not a girl. He knew now that he was face to face with an Iele. Iele are powerful creatures in Romanian folklore. They are forest spirits that live in the wilderness and are known to seduce men who come across them. They were feared by many villagers over the centuries, with some even dedicating entire festivals to appease them. They take the form of beautiful young women and seek out men who are greedy or selfish. The Iele are also fiercely protective of their homes, and if you wander into their territory, they could kill you for your ignorance. My grandfather had grown up knowing about them, but never dreamed he would actually see one. He lay there, frantically thinking that he was next, but the Iele didn't touch him. She only continued that horribly melodic dance, her bloody smile still directed towards my grandfather. Don't, Don't worry. worry, she told him in a playful voice that was fragmented and wrong. I like you. 
My grandfather didn't say a word, still stuck in shock at the sight before him. The Iele never missed a beat in her fiery dance, continuing to move step by step around the circle over and over again in a calculated pattern. As soon as he realized that the Iele wasn't going to come for him, his body seemed to jolt back into action and he jumped from his place, taking off into the night as quickly as he could, away from the Iele and the drumming. He dashed back to camp, out of breath and terrified, and hurried to explain to the others what he had just seen. No one believed him right away, of course, but they all rushed to grab their weapons and followed his directions back to the spot regardless. My grandpa begged them not to go, but when he saw that they were going, he forced himself to join them. He couldn't stay behind while they could be going to their deaths. But thankfully, by the time they all managed to get their guns and trek back to where the ELA was, the sun had just begun to crest over the horizon. When they arrived, the ELA was gone. All they found was the scorched circle of grass, the commander's mangled bones in the center, and a trail of burnt footsteps leading back into the woods. The soldiers were speechless. Not all of them believed in things like the ELA, but none of them could deny the sight they were left with. They could never explain it to the army, at least, not in the way that it happened. They all silently agreed with each other that it would be best if they never spoke of that night and the evil they saw. They marked the commander's cause of death as enemy combat and sent his body back in a closed casket. No one ever questioned them about it, and none of them ever mentioned it again. But my grandpa said he was never the same after that night. He returned to the site where it happened five months later during the day with the hopes that he could gain some closure. But when he saw the area again, it only intensified his fears. The grass had never regrown. The circle and footsteps that the Iele had left remained barren and black, despite it being months since that night. The earth itself seemed to be permanently scarred by the creature's presence, and the only thing that could survive where the Iele had touched were mushrooms and other fungi. Nothing green, nothing healthy. The ground was dead. My grandfather turned around and never looked back that day. He told me and my cousins that he had night terrors for many years after that, and it took him a long time to be able to go outside in the dark. He always felt guilty about his commander's death and wondered that maybe if he hadn't let the ELA go, if he had followed orders, the man's life would have been spared. But on some level, he knew it wouldn't have mattered. The commander's cold and unmoving nature made him a target for the spirit immediately. And the only reason she spared my grandfather was because of his kind and selfless nature. But every time he told us the story, my grandpa would always end by saying how her words would haunt him forever. I, I like you. you. He never wanted to hear that otherworldly voice again. And thankfully, he never did. He taught me and my cousins that kindness and generosity can be more powerful than you think and that you should always put others above yourselves. Who knows? Someday, it might even save your life. You can teach people how to perform kindness, but you can't teach someone how to be kind. In magic, intention is everything. It's the vibrational core of all your actions. And Gloria's grandfather radiated compassion. That's why he was spared that night. For me, this story is a reminder to practice kindness and gratitude every single day so that when you are faced with something like an Iele, you won't have a difficult time knowing what to do. Little children have a way of teaching us lessons and showing us hard truths. So what was Abraham, the ghost boy at Gunslinger Gulch, trying to tell me? I've always been a believer, even though before filming Ghost Town Terror, I hadn't had many paranormal experiences of my own. I'd mostly had spiritual things happen to me, but nothing like the classic ghost stories I love to share. 
And then, on the very last night we were investigating, something happened that broke my brain. I don't think that timing was accidental. I'm starting to think that the little boy Abraham was taunting me, toying with me. He waited until the end to let me know that he was there. He gave me just enough to leave me confused and second-guessing myself. But that brief moment inspired me to start working on my own abilities and protection. I realized I never wanted to be in that position again of not being able to accurately sense the energies around me. I've been meditating, taking classes, working with healers, communicating with my guides and my ancestors, and am so much more confident than I've ever been before. That tap on the hand ended up being the kick in the butt I needed. So if I ever have to return to that place, I'll be ready, without a doubt. 